One day you'll make a good president of these United States. No innocent person's got nothing to fear in this country. Anything you want, we got it in the USA. And if it's movies you want, you are at the right place at the right time. Because I'm Bill Harris. And I'm Rex Reed. And you are at the movies. Later on in the program, we'll take a look at what that greatest of the great apes, King Kong himself, is really made of. But first, Rex starts the show off with a raunchy, rowdy, supposed comedy called She's Gotta Have It. Well, the movies have traditionally depicted black women as either immoral tramps or domestics or the hard-working but long-suffering matriarchs who slave over their ironing boards to provide a better world for their kids while black men have all the fun. She's Gotta Have It. This is a new movie. It introduces a new kind of black heroine who smashes all of those stereotypes. Her name is Nola Darling from Brooklyn. And this time, it's the girl in the catbird seat, and the guys are all dopes. She's got one boyfriend named Jamie, who is solid and sensitive, but he's dull. Then there's Greer, a slick dude with a big, shiny sports car and plenty of jack. He's exciting, but he's too smug and bossy. Then there's Mars, played by the film's director-writer, Spike Lee. He's a bike-riding little shrimp with big glasses and jive talk, and he makes her laugh, but he's too crazy, and he's undependable. Now, Spike Lee has been called the Black Woody Allen by a lot of critics, and in this scene, you'll see why. Yours, huh? Oh, thanks. I like, I like. What's the rent? It's cheap. Yeah? Yeah. You know, we could put a divider right here, and you'll have a roommate and me, and <laughs> never know I'm here. <laughs> You're right, I'll never know. How come every time I let a guy up here, the first thing they want to do is move in? Well, you work, you got a nice crib, and you're fine. Mm. What makes you think I want somebody to take care of? I didn't say that. You know, I didn't say that. I pay my own way. I'm not looking for no meal ticket. Mm. So what do you do? What's your job? I'm a layout pasta artist. I do mechanics and magazines. Yeah, you know. yeah. There's something about you. About me? Uh-huh. Good or bad? <laughs> I haven't figured it out yet. You let me know, all right? You'll be the first to know. You let me know? Mm -hmm. You let me know? Yeah. You let me know? Sure. You let me know? Yeah. Nola invites all three of her lovers for Thanksgiving, hoping that all these pieces are going to come together, but it's a disaster. Baby. I'll give you more later tomorrow. Yeah? White, please. Figures. This is the first Thanksgiving I've ever cooked. The first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first? Honey, this food is absolutely delicious. Don't listen to him. It's better than delicious. Honey, for dessert, try some of my homemade sweet potato pie. you love it. Also, I brought bottles of Martinelli sparkling cider. Wait, 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 wait. I didn't know. I know I was supposed to bring something. No, why didn't you tell me? You didn't have to bring anything. It's okay? It's okay. It's okay? It's okay. But I didn't bring nothing. You're fine. It's okay? Yeah. Yeah, no, did I ever tell you about the time I met Jesse Jackson? No. I didn't tell you? No. So I told you. <laughs> tell me now. Yeah, it was like five years ago, you know, and I was walking down the street and I saw Jesse Jackson. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I went over to talk to Jesse. I said, Jesse, you know, we talked, ba 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 I said, Jesse, you know, one day you make a good present to these United States. Look what happened. He ran. It was me, Morris Blackman. I gave him my deal. Run, Jesse, run. <laughs> my ideal. Run, Jesse, run. Lies. Lies. Greer, who are you calling a lie? You heard what I said. I believe you. Thank you, no, it's the truth. Who'd you vote for, Ronnie, baby? She's got to have it. It's bright, it's breezy, sometimes it's even outrageously funny. It was made for peanuts, too. We're talking very little money here, mostly in one room in Brooklyn, but Spike Lee gets more out of this little budget than most big directors with billion-dollar Hollywood bombs. It's a visual treat, too. It's in black and white, but when one lover tells Nola to close her eyes, click her heels three times, and say there's no place like home, like Dorothy, the film turns into vivid technicolor like The Wizard of Oz. The actors all have a sassy, improvisational style that gives the film its comic thrust. They turn and address the camera to tell their sides of the story, just like Rashomon. 
But best of all, when Nola loves them and leaves them, refusing to make a choice, she's just as happy to be alone. Because unlike most tragic black women in movie history who always end up crying the blues, this girl really likes herself. I liked her too. And just about everything else about she's got to have it. Well, let's get started that I didn't like She's Gotta Have It, and she can have it for all of me. I didn't like the acting, I didn't like the story, I didn't like the characters. It was bleak and dreary, and sort of a who cares. You didn't think it was funny? I no, thought a I lot didn't of it laugh was a, That jive talk was very funny. Spike jive Lee talk? could open tomorrow at the improvisation. Well, it might be a good career. Um, I have nothing bad to say about uh, independent filmmakers. You know, they're the future of the industry. $200,000, he did the virtual impossible. But he's got independent filmmakers still have to be dependent on an audience. I don't know who's going to... New York, they're going crazy for this, aren't they? Lines, people applauding, cheering. And meanwhile, he's given a lot of black actors a chance to play something besides pimps and and uh, right. drug dealers and, you know, and hoods on the screen. Well, good I, point on that one. But New York audiences are never, to me, a criterion. But I it's an say, interesting... Don't, don't, don't you think it's an interesting feminist slant on the old movies that, where one nice girl loved a guy and he had three women on the side? Now it's the guys who are hanging from the ropes. That and the movie doesn't judge her either. One of my favorite pieces about the judged or unjudged is the black and white photographs. They're very evocative, very... The old neighborhood stills. Those I really like. But, you know, I maintain that New Yorkers will go to see anything. And I, well, I don't think America will go to see this. Well, maybe not, but, I, you know, who knows what America will go to see. The uh, day I figure that out, I'll be running Paramount. We'll all be real rich, won't we? <laughs> Boy, will it be true. We'll see what happens then. We'll be back later. Next, a 12-year-old Canadian girl wants to be 16. She also wants to be somewhere else until she meets her American cousin. Shirley, this is my American cousin, Butch, and that's Rosie Hartman. I'm going to go jump in the lake. Good idea. Oh, it's a Canadian film. It's a film which captured six Genie Awards. They're the Oscars of Canada. It's a look at life on the family farm, uh, or in this case, on the family cherry ranch, with a very bored, almost 13-year-old girl. Her summer doldrums back in 1959 improved drastically when her hip and handsome California cousin arrives unexpectedly at the ranch in a snazzy red Cadillac Barrett's convertible. Young Margaret Langrick makes her film debut here, along with newcomer John Wildman, each of them won their country's Best Actor Award. And when Cousin Butch arrives, young Sandy has a brand new idol and a whole new show and tell. Hi, Sue. Yeah, it's me, Sandy. Listen, we got this American cousin staying with us. Yeah. California. Honest. He's way cuter than Barry Bent. I'm not joking. Mm, his car is so fabulous. I've never seen anything like it. No joke. Oh. I'm going to get him to take us for a car ride. Sue? i got to go. Talk to last. The grown-ups find the new cousin headstrong and unreliable, but Sandy and her young pals are a gog and a giggle with sentiments that are not exactly reciprocated. That's him. this for a minute. I'll tell you what. If you girls all sit in the back, we'll cruise to Cologne and back. What about the A&W? Forget about the A&W. Now that's the deal. Take it or leave it. I'll tell you, when he hits that ranch, Cousin Butch creates quite a sensation. He smokes. He drives fast. Listens to rock and roll and seems ready to mess around, which eventually he does. John Wildman also seems ready to drive producers and at least younger female audiences wild. In the opening, young Langrick writes in her diary, nothing ever happens. 
Well, in the film, it never really does either. My American Cousin is a sweet and tender film, a nostalgic reminiscence from the life of writer-director Sandy Wilson. I liked it. The cast and characters are charming. There's nothing not to like. There's also just nothing to really get excited about either. I tell you, I feel like this movie is like Margaret Trudeau. It should have stayed in Canada. It's, uh, I call it Canadian graffiti. <laughs> That's real yeah. wonderful. I really have a lot of trouble dealing with all of these movies about miserable American teenagers in 1959, much less Canadian teenagers mm -hmm. in 1959. However, the kids are pretty good in the movie, and it has a nice feeling of nostalgia. I, you know, the A&W root beer stand, uh, yeah, where, where we used to hang out as kids, and, and all the ducktails and the ponytails on the girls, and the drag races, and the proms, and the... And it the does, James Dean movies, it's it has a kind of nice little feeling, it is, but it is so trivial that it just evaporates while you're watching it. I mean, I've, I've Canada's best saying, picture of the year. I mean, they're off. This they says away with, a lot about you, the state of, of Canadian, Canadian films. films you know, today. what it says something about the state of uh, the producer and director writer uh, Sandy Wilson's uh, finances when it was nominated for all six Oscars. They couldn't telephone her because her phone had been turned off because she hadn't paid the bills. I don't think it'll be, uh, I don't think it will repeat the same success in competing for Oscars in this country. I'm almost certain you're right. But I do think that it was charming. I liked the little girl who'd never acted before. I thought she was nice. The, uh, the hunk cousin, I don't know what he's going to do, take acting lessons. He needs lessons. some elocution lessons. The grown-ups in the picture I thought were atrocious. Mm -hmm. Dreadful. And unpleasant. Just we didn't care about them at all. And and the little girl, little girl though, she's the key to me. Okay. Well, Canadian films have a, a history really of being slow and kind of dreary. And well, in that case, they're right in the keeping. Yeah, aren't absolutely. They? Now, coming up next, the tables turn when a victim manages to entrap her attacker in extremities. This is Chicago. If you saw Farrah Fawcett's amazing performance on television as a battered housewife in The Burning Bed, you already know the girl no longer acts with her hair. The big screen has been slower to recognize her talent, but Extremities is the movie and the role that could change her luck and launch her career as a serious film actress for good. Based on the hit play that has been shocking audiences throughout the world, Extremities starts out as just another tense but routine thriller about an innocent girl stalked by a rapist. But this one has a twist. This time, the victim becomes the aggressive predator and her attacker becomes the prey. Farrah Fawcett is the girl. She's selected at random by a man in a ski mask who terrorizes her in a parking lot. James Russo is the would-be rapist. And this scene shows the paralyzing terror that she feels when she narrowly escapes his first assault. Uh, uh, I want you to see your face. After a second attack in her own home, the victim turns the tables on her intruder, but she realizes even then she may never win. <laughs> control now she realizes that her survival still depends on forcing a confession from her prisoner with her two terrified roommates as witnesses tell them what you did to me i didn't do nothing this is your chance to save yourself tell them how you tried to smother me look at her and look at me who did what to who Tell them how you made me touch you. No innocent person's got nothing to fear in this country. 
Now, I'm not saying one more word until I talk to my attorney. That's that. It's his work against mine. Well, it would spoil the impact if I told you how Extremities ends, but let me tell you this. It's full of surprises. Tight direction by Robert M. Young and a set of finely tuned performances by not only the star, but by Diana Scarwood and Alfre Woodard as her roommates, and especially by the dynamic James Russo, who's a young Marlon Brando who plays the rapist. They all make you feel the humiliation and the terror that a rape victim goes through. Farah plays both the physical torment and the psychological torment a rape victim goes through with great honesty and conviction. Now, we've all seen rape movies, but in this case, the defenseless victim gets a rare chance to play judge, jury, and executioner. And a lot of women are going to identify with this feminist departure and cheer. Others are going to dismiss extremities as a female death wish. There's no doubt it's a controversial film. I found it slick hypnotic, fascinating. It's a rare experience, and it made me re-examine my own values. It does exactly that, and I hope that every man and woman who sees this film re-examines those values, and the inequities in the legal system that are pointed out subtly and, and chillingly. The horror in this film, when he sits there on the floor, he's her captive, and he says, no problem, I go to jail, I get out, I get you. Well, you and she knows it's true, and so does the audience. The film is deceptive because it seems like a, a regular narrative kind of a piece of filmmaking, you know, a thriller. You're very right, opens but routinely, it, you say. within that framework, it does raise a very serious question. When the law fails the victims of crime, do they then have the right to take the law in their own hands? Well, you know what happens at Death Wish or anything, any uh, piece of theater when you're listening to the audience, they say, yeah, and they're saying, slam him, hurt him, go for him. Yeah. Sarah felt then very there strongly others, about this Then there film. are others, too, who say, oh, no, you know, the liberals get That's very right. upset. I always think I'm very liberal, but a movie like this makes me look at both sides of the, of the issues, and uh, it, it shocked me. Sarah said she was fascinated to play this. She turned down something like $2 million worth of work and a series commitment to do extremities and to bring it to screen because of what it can do. It'll certainly do that for her career, as you say. I hope that everyone sees this one. I like it It certainly lot. proves that Charlie's angel is no angel anymore. <laughs> <laughs> She's put that all behind her, and not just in time, too. Coming up next, time to check up on old banana breath, the one and only Mighty Kong. <laughs> Why, yes. Some native superstition, isn't it? A god or a spirit or something. Well, anyway, neither beast nor man. Something monstrous, all-powerful, still living, still holding that island in a grip of deadly fear. Since 1933, the King hasn't seen a whole lot of action. A sequel here, a remake there. Not much steady work for a creature that shocked the world over 50 years ago. But Hollywood is a way of resuscitating old greats. And thanks to Universal Studios, the King is back. After 11 years of research and three years of actual assembly, a computerized 30-foot King Kong has emerged as the biggest star in Hollywood. He weighs six and a half tons. He costs six and a half million dollars. His head alone stands over 10 feet tall. The beast even exudes a horrible banana breath odor. The architect of this extravaganza is Tom Reidenbach. We didn't want to create just a big screaming gorilla, but we did want to show emotion. We wanted to be able to show uh, fear and curiosity and anger and fright. By employing a computer, the Universal Tours King Kong is capable of 29 different functions, including crashing helicopters from the sky and curling those monkey lips. We provided motions in the shoulders and the chest so that all the major sections of the body are literally in motion at all times. Pretty heavy. They provided a lot more than motion. It took costumers six full weeks to sew 600 pounds of fur onto one of filmdom's favorite beasts. A beast that has hosted more than one million visitors in his first 45 days, and who never tires through 200 performances a day. It's tough work, but Kong is, after all, an old pro. After 53 years roaming the earth without a place to call his own, King Kong has finally come home 
the six and a half million dollar beast is at Universal Studios in California, and you are invited. After all, how could you possibly follow an act like King Kong? Rick? Can't help you, Bill. You're the one who decided to live in California. I'd rather see the early movie than take a trip out there to see that. Anyway. Another dig against Los Angeles. <laughs> I could have expected. Actually, you know what you reminded me of in that hand? Jessica Lange screaming for help when her career was almost destroyed by the Dino De Laurentiis remake of King Kong. She looked like somebody stuck in a design research chair. <laughs> I don't think I'm happy with the analogy, but I'll take it. You know, and coming up in December, Dino De Laurentiis, one more time. This one's King Kong Lives, and he has a girlfriend. Oh. You ready? I hate to even think about the progeny. Let's this is not show business. It's turning into monkey business now. <laughs> I'll take that one, too. <laughs> right now, though, let's review the films on this show. I thought She's Gotta Have It didn't okay, have it. I give it one and a half stars. Right Rex enjoyed the role reversal. He gives it three stars. He's not. Oh. The two of us had a near agreement on My American Cousin. Rex gives it a lukewarm two stars. I went a little extra, gave it two and a half. And we both are in agreement on the sensational extremities and on the two riveting performances by James Russo and star Farrah Fawcett. Rex gives it three stars. I'll go a little further with three and a half. That's it for this week. Next week, we'll be back with a special presentation. And until then...